my name is Juliana, and I've been in a bit of a writing hole lately. And so I'm going to share with you some of the stuff that I've been writing. And my dear friend Joe um, is going to provide some mood on the piano, so I hope you're into that. Um, I guess I'll just start. I woke up this morning wanting to feel regal, dignified, modest in the way a sort of Game of Thrones or Ren Faire inspired period piece look makes you feel. I walked into a room. The floor was covered in neck ruffs, outdated collars, corsets, veils, tapestries, and broken pieces of Greco-Roman columns. A large fan at the top of the room blew shreds of printed JPEGs, of constitutions, decrees, revolutionary text, and other things older, wider versions of the man, past, used to certify in the word the merger of thought and object. The walls of this very large room were completely covered in screens, looping scenes of American actors speaking in British accents, playing characters both fictional and real-ish in nature of ancient Egypt, 18th century France, Babylon, so forth and so on, all exclusively in British accents. The historical revealed itself to me as a cosplay, a fantasy fiction whose ostensibly modest voice forgot the specifics of the situation. It's a shoe buckle on a Banana Republic boot with a knee-length sock sitting on a fainting couch from CB2 with gold Rococo detailing. It's princes, queens, and other worlds bound to certain dresses, architectures, and topos that have striking and vague resemblances to vaguely coherent notions of other times, presumably in the past. It demanded that I appeal to it, appease it. After all, it's the guardian of regality, temporal dignity, antiquity, and the tastefully wise. The gate through which I might converse with the totality of what we might call progress. Coloring and coloring books, Disney princesses with brown crayons for skin and bl black crayons for hair, as if they had relaxers in the 18th century. Clinging to stories of the Moors, even if in spite of the inclination to believe that they were at best Arab. At least I knew they didn't have pink nipples, and at least I knew their freckles were black. Every like on medievalpoc.tumblr.com is an affirmation that the royalty I aspire to confer has not been completely whitewashed or tainted by the tuck underneath my petticoat, hiding the black member that betrays any claim to a legacy-based entanglement with history that I might have. I'm reliving images of green ivy, growing on the walls of secret gardens, foregrounding imprints of Naomi Campbell wearing an Elizabethan-inspired dress from the McQueen Fall Winter 2013 collection. On my mind in another time, watching the body drift through triangular passages seen at sea level as my eyes emerge just above the tumultuous waters that miss my nose. Thanks only to the grace of the angel of history who holds me high enough to witness the vessels that bear the honor of digging through the material remains to select the catastrophe to tell the story of what came before. I'm dehydrated with impatience, thirsting for the moment where free men and relics of the Harlem Renaissance cross into the twilight zone, that gray and unclear passage between yesterday, once upon a time, and the historical, between a named period and the ancient, where is this line, if there is one that moves up and in what increments? When does a decade disappear into the mass, that which came after the historic but retains a certain pomp and circumstance of that which predates the merely old? There are certain facts that cannot be disputed. The Egyptians definitely didn't have pink nipples, even if their orifices were otherwise. And that's that. Um, so the next thing I wrote is, um, um, so I was sort of like trying to find inspiration for, I'm working on a manuscript right now, um, and I needed to produce a lot, and I was trying to find inspiration, and I never really revisited my hometown. I'm from Bryan College Station, Texas, which is, um, 
hey, I'm to all y'all who know where that is. Um, it's a really small, conservative, sort of depressing town, um, but there's like a weird sort of wounded attachment that I have to it and certain um, boys from the area. So I wrote a piece sort of inspired by that. Um, Ham. Sometimes it's hard for a colored girl like myself to tell the difference between a scar and a fetish. I was never literally a slave, but I realized that history carves out legacies for its unborn subjects. I was born and raised into quite a peculiar situation. I grew up around country folk, country white folk. The, time, the type whose forefathers and foremothers may have owned slaves, but more than likely were overseers, indentured servants. I learned very quickly that I was different. A forbidden object in my hometown where an interracial couple was shocking. I loved the boys from an early age and easily exacted seduction. Clay, Colton, Clint, Bubba, and Bryce. I didn't know early on what it all meant, but I knew that I liked to play. I was a black girl, at least as far as my peers were concerned, in a world of cowboys, kickers, and white trash. A cowboy hat, a pickup truck, some military service, probably listening to Alan Jackson. I lost my virginity in a pickup truck to a boy named Anthony. He was simple decidedly masculine and he was infatuated with me and my body. Something about the color of my skin made him rise. I went on to hook up with a lot of them in similar positions, many of whom dated the popular white girls at my school, more than likely said nigger on a semi-regular basis, but in the privacy of their room, my room, a truck, a pool, on a property off Highway 6, they were free to let their desires flow. The suppressed urge to ride my fist and preciously manicured fingers onto the moving blades of a blender set to seven, smoothie. Poured all over a chicken breast, looking and wondering what nigger sauce tastes like if you grill it. Suspended above flames, caramelized caramel skin. Hold on. Mm-hmm. Wait. Baby, pass me a little molasses so I can sweeten it a little, so that when they eat the chicken, broken into pieces just small enough to resemble ground white pepper chunks to the lazy eye, the same eye that isn't noticing my maimed hand, I don't scream and I don't cry because what's the use? I'm sitting here, wallowing in my own self-pity, bleeding from the arm silently. I don't want to give a show, I just want them to eat the chicken. As the saying goes, if nobody knows the trouble I've seen and nobody knows my sorrow, if nobody knows the troubles I've seen, then I guess I'll wait till tomorrow. Purse my lips and squint my eyes, knowing Jesus ain't on the main line, and insist on wrapping my tattered hopes away in a future or other time. And then there was life in College Station. Going to the H-E-B for the 20th time in a row, making a grocery list of things that I in no way need but the thrill of purchasing them, the colors, the journey there, listening to music in my car, the crunch of the bag, and the buildup. I went to Walmart every single day of my life. Greeted by the morbidly obese to the point of being impaired woman in the scooter who would greet me back again, back again. Hoping that they had stocked a new type of gel pen to add to my growing collection, I had purchased nearly every type of colored pen available in my town. Searching for new ways to make my laundry more efficient, browsing through the fishing section for new pendants that I would never actually use for jewelry. Potential, potentiality, everything rested on a potentiality. This ever-present intention that you would be the image in the ad on the billboard outside of Post Oak Mall on High Highway 6, being so fucking bored that even drinking becomes mundane, night after night of beer pong, lip cups, the conservative boys, loose only by virtue of their drinking and youth, would demand that I play with them as one of the bitches, because after all, I'm a bitch too when we're playing chandeliers. The same 14 songs played on repeat, driving around in circles, working minimum wage only to spend it on gas to feel like something was moving. Divisions between new housing developments and developments in old, circumstantial at best. The new houses were the same as the old, and from bird's eye view or a Google map, they were all the exact same shape and color. It was baffling to me, so many people and life ended at 8 p.m. The men remained infatuated, exotic by virtue of my brain and blackness, or I'd like to think. I learned quickly that there was a power I could wield. The men of the South liquefied my heart. It's a mentality that a life so simple breeds. 
football and baseball player dads who had nothing better to do than work out and eat barbecue. Diets that sustain the type of men you look at in bewilderment when they die at age 35 of a heart attack. Protein and sauce. Barbecue brisket with a smoked hickory molasses sauce. Chicken fried gravy, chicken fried steak smothered in the thickest white gravy. Always a preference for dark meat. Body solidified with the sort of foundation a city gym membership could never replicate. A layer of fat from all the syrup, lard, and salt. Body sticky to the touch and red under the uneven share of solar energy that Texas is burdened with. Simple and untouched by neuroses, seemingly losing control over their impulses. I'd like to think in my delusional mind that I appear to them like something out of a dream they didn't know was possible to have. Unleashing an unchanneled energy. They who had little to say, little to do after work, and far too much energy. Excesses of private spheres and basic necessary resources available in unlimited amounts. $200 a month could get you a cute room and a two bedroom and a one bedroom depending on what point in the past decade the edifice was constructed. Having a car was as much an assumption as having a wallet and time was endless. They knew their body and nothing else. The kind that jacked off six times a day and could still fuck another four. Boys with twangs and isolated lives, neither depressed nor overjoyed, just becoming. He liked his drinks sweet, his servings large, and his clothes all cotton. Going out consisted of drinking at one of ten total spots for the indefinite future until perhaps he settled down. When he fucked, it was something spectacular. East Bay catalogs, academy sports and gears, men as masculine in the most proper sense. The performance so internalized it evaded the specificity of bodies. A trained instinct for recognizing his counterpart among the masses of bodies in the South. The ideas of what a woman was could cover a range so wide and largely by default, an encounter with the femininity cultivated and not taken for granted was quite rare. Soft gestures, jeans just tight enough not to transgress the boundary between what I was allowed to indulge and asking at least publicly for a beating. They had developed a sense for it and were drawn to it. Nails resting on a collarbone, on a collarbone. A voice both markedly proper and decidedly soft. They seemed to lack control, rose, swelled, a salty fuck. Their egos immediately saw a soft black body split in the back of a pickup truck. It felt like love at first sight. I would see him, feel his movement. His house was often bare, the few posters available almost laughably generic. If you've ever wondered who buys the posters in the mounted flip catalog in Walmart, it's him. A state flag, a Budweiser-sponsored promo poster from a football game, scattered beer, a single bench press, if multiple occupancy, a beer pong table, lube, condoms, maybe, always a television, and the saddest kitchen you've ever seen. Three single-watt frosted incandescent bulbs in floral shades torpidly emitting just enough light to recoil off of eggshell white walls in a two-bedroom apartment. A living room with taupe carpets. Past choices in couch placement are apparent in the dark patches that smell to varying degrees of what I imagine the aggregate scent of the insides of houses in the town built between 1967 and 1994, as it would linger in vacuum filters and the smell of aged air conditioners as old microscopic skin cells rattle out with the first gust after being turned on. It's a smell that brings me home to a sense of freedom. An abolition from the restrictive politics as be when the presence of collective snakeskin boots, Wrangler jeans, and Semper Fi, Calvin peeing on Hobbes bumper stickers monitors the individual urge to taste and transgress boundaries drawn in melanin and outdated laws. I love to drive in rush hour in the thick 97% humidity of 90 degree weather in July. Surrounded by men in pickups, F-150s, extended cabs, rangers, and silverados. Observing his gentility. Thank you.